Let me know when we're live. Okay, we are live. Good afternoon, everyone. Hey, good morning, actually. Hey, uh, my name is Vu Ming Huang. I am the major coordinator for Vietnam Studies here at Fulbright University, Vietnam. Welcome to yet another amazing lunch talk as part of our The World Beyond a Book uh, series, which uh, features uh, the best uh, minds that have been writing and researching uh, the best new books on Vietnam. And today, uh, I have a real treat for you. It's uh, one of my old, very good, very good friends, uh, Professor uh, Christian Lenz, who is the author of a very famous, uh, well-received book a couple of years ago, Contested Territory Viet Bien Phu and the Making of Northwest Vietnam which was also the winner of the 2021 uh, Association of Asian Studies Bender Prize for Outstanding First Book in Southeast Asian Studies. That's not just the best book uh, in Vietnam Studies, just the best book in Southeast Asian Studies for 2021. Uh, so uh, huge congratulations, Christian, for, for, for that. Um, I, I had the, uh, the great, oh, thank, uh, yeah, <laughs> Our audience. Um, and uh, well, I, I had the, the pleasure to 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 hear you speak uh, at Cornell when uh, your return to to your alma mater when uh, the book uh, first came out, and uh, it's really uh, an amazing uh, honor to welcome you here to to our institution, Fulbright University Vietnam in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, while um, uh, Christian uh, is this year. Uh, on exchange at the Asia Research Institute in spring 2023, uh, uh, which is in Singapore. He's uh, studying frontier politics in Highland Vietnam, as well as the relations between Vietnam and Indonesia during an era of anti-colonial internationalism. So Christian has, has really um, a, a, a very unique toolbox, if you will. Uh, he has uh, excellent Indonesian, excellent Vietnamese, excellent French, excellent uh, English, and, and so on. So, so he, it allows him to, to draw these amazing connections, and I can't wait to to um, hear what you find. He's also a very mysterious guy. I actually just, um, you know, it's very hard to track his movement. I message him on Facebook, no answer. Uh, we're friends, by the way. But, uh, you know, um, I was just doing uh, archival research in Archives 3 in Hanoi, uh, National uh, State Archives 3, a couple months back, and I saw in the logs, you can't escape the archives logs, Christian. In the archives logs, it says you've been in uh, recently, and so I was like, hey, you're here. <laughs> you got to come, and I, I should also thank uh, Vice Provost Mira Seo, who also, who also alerted me to the fact that you were in Singapore, and it's, it's great that, um, so first Christian said, you know, um, I, I really want to give a talk with you guys, but only when it's in person. And I said, well, you know what, let's, let's figure out a way make that happen, and I'm, I'm glad that it has happened here. So, what is this talk about? It's titled, Arduous but Romantic, Gender, Ethnicity, and Territory in Vietnam, which examines the familial relationships, gendered representations, and cultural differences that spring from the ongoing construction of Vietnamese territory in and around Dien Bien Phu. Is, um, uh, the title borrows from a cadre who mobilized local women during the Dien Bien Phu campaign of 1953-54. His memoir recalls a moment when hundreds of thousands of soldiers, workers, and officials embarked from historic centers of King Viet civilization to contest Imperial France's hold over the culturally diverse borderlands with Laos and China. Far from one-way domination, the relations between these King pioneers forged with local Thai, Khmu, Hmong, Dao, and other ethno-linguistic groups uh, were and remained shaped by local processes. Uh, connect uh, joined us online last week uh, as we dialogue with uh, our own Professor Andrew Belisari um, and Bu Kheng Ming over their work um, on, on the uh, Dick Vân process and, and the uh, difficult, the, the, the challenge, uh, the challenges that the uh, North African soldiers of the French Union face when they 
uh, actually did defect to the Viet Minh um, and try to live out the, the socialist dream in, in North Vietnam. It's, it's in many ways very fitting that today we continue that discussion about uh, Vietnamese national identity, about race, about um, you know, what it means uh, to build socialist Vietnam, especially in these early years with Christian Lens. I do apologize to our, our live audience here that uh, uh, the food is a little delayed in coming, but uh, I, I, I am sure that just as the aid uh, is sure to flow from China, as sure as the, the convoys were, were going to make them up the mountains of Dien Bien Phu, for sure the uh, Bang Mi will come. Uh, so uh, please sit back, relax, uh, enjoy the talk, and uh, the provisions shall arrive. Thank you, Christian. Okay. Well, I want to start, so we're alive, let's see. Can I, let's see. Okay, excellent, just see, perfect. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Tae Huang, for your generous introduction and moreover for your invitation to come to Fulbright University. I, all want to, I also want to thank uh, Tae Sean for a wonderful conversation, um, Ko V, who just disappeared, who has helped to build our Vietnamese language program at University of North Carolina. And I want to also just say what a, what a special pleasure it is to come here today <clears throat> to Fulbright University. Um, some of the slides, including this one, and this uh, are based on research that was funded by a Fulbright um, scholarship back in 2006, 2007. So it feels very special to come back and to see the next generation of Fulbright students and to speak with you today. Um, so I'm going to just jump in, okay? Um, so I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes um, and then leave plenty of time, I hope, for questions and answers. Um, and so I'm going to talk for a bit about the book, but I'm going to try and connect that book with what some of my more recent research is. And so you'll see that as I, as I talk. Okay, so today my talk features a humble place that became famous throughout the world because a battle there determined the outcome of the first Indochina war. And that battle entangled an event with a place. The event, that is, on May 7, 1954, after 60 days of siege warfare, the People's Army de uh, defeated the French expeditionary forces at Dien Bien Phu. The event galvanized peace talks happening simultaneously in Geneva, Switzerland, and the victory effectively spelled the end of French Indochina, securing independence not just for Vietnam, but also for Laos and Cambodia. It earned equal measure of fame across the decolonizing global south and infamy among anti-communists in the rising Cold War. But this all took place in a place. In 1953, <clears throat> Dien Bien Phu was but a humble market town in the Black River borderlands. Dien Bien Phu in Vietnamese means border post prefecture situating it on the edge of claimed Vietnamese space. But its local Thai name, Mương Thai, means heavenly place, situating it at the center of a very different world and a very different cosmology. So note here again this contrast between center and periphery, depending on which language and which cultural referent you use. Now my method is based on three different um, modes of research. Okay. First, there are archival research. This is a picture of Archives 3 taken in 2012. In addition, I worked in French archives, Chateau Vincennes, the military archives uh, in Paris, as well as the overseas archives in Aix-en-Provence, ECPAD, the Médiathèque de la Défense. You'll see some pictures from there, as well as Archives 1 and other collections locally in Dien Bien Phu. Of course, I worked in the field. This gives a sense, this is actually literally a rice field um, in Muong Fang, made famous by its location for General Zapp's bunker, and then on the road between them, okay? And my ethnographic experience informed my archival interpretation just as much as my archival interpretation influenced what I saw in the field. So again, the entanglement of event and place helps explain female anxiety in relation to male mobility. And that is my theme for today, okay? Anxiety among women produced by mobility. 
to my argument. In other words, geographic context matters here. Gendered mobility and affect originated in a formative event in Vietnamese territorial construction and lingers in a variety of forms into our present. Okay. Now, although militarization initially blurred the home front with the battlefront, even merging the two, the embattled processes ultimately reproduced gendered divisions of labor, whereby women tend the home front, while men, either because of duty or opportunity, travel far from home, thus generating anxiety in the domestic sphere. Further, as you can see in some of these photographs, okay, femininity in Dien Bien Phu is coded ethnically as Thai, and masculinity is normalized as kin. And this resonates very much with a line that came out of uh, the Viet Minh Front's work in the 1940s, Doan Ket, Tai Kin, okay, unity between kin and Thai, which was a line earlier used to mobilize people um, in the 1940s through the 1950s, okay? But it had unexpected effects, I will argue, okay? And we must situate these Thai and kin relations in a larger, almost like a matrix, a very complex ethnic and gender matrix, okay? Where on the one hand, you have a very diverse local society, not just Thai, but also Hmong, Kumu, Lolo, Zhao, and so on, as well as men, women, each of whom benefit from different resources and class backgrounds, okay? Stated differently, <clears throat> my argument is that all the historic work that went into the battle established gendered and ethnicized relationships in space that in turn irrevocably linked the Red River Delta, especially Hanoi, to the Black River borderlands, especially Dien Bien Phu. As a result, what we know today as Northwest Vietnam, or Vung Thế Bac, bears the cultural residue of earlier and ongoing processes of territorial construction. So in a nutshell, I'm not going to go into great detail about the theory um, behind this, but I'm happy to answer questions as we move along, okay? My main argument is that I draw from different scholars. Emily Ye, geographer, argues that territory is an ongoing social process, okay? Stuart Eldon argues that territory is a very powerful political technology, okay? That rests on calculative measures, okay? How to measure space, how to measure population within it. I argue, in addition, that it is also an unintended outcome of mutable social relations, okay? And in this, I am engaging the literature on Zomia, okay? That is Willem van Skendel, Jean Michaud, Jim Scott, and so on, okay? I'm also thinking about what, we would, what I would call embodied labor, okay? That is thinking about gender and ethnicity, as well as hunger and affect that is produced through work, okay? Work in particular on behalf and for the state, okay? And in this, I'm drawing on agrarian studies, as well as anthropology. Marav Shohit's work is wonderful. Um, silence and sacrifice is very helpful here. Feminist geography is also quite useful to think about embodiment. And I also want to think um, about how that goes into infrastructure, okay? Infrastructure in particular, the built environment that dates exactly to the moment when the Dien Bien Phu battle was happening. Roads, bridges, and other connective infrastructure. I also want to emphasize that militarization has been a very useful way to think about conflict, okay? Militarization, according to Michael Geyer, is a tense and contradictory social process that compresses social formations through violence, okay? Here also Dirk Bonker's work is quite useful. And I would argue that that militarization during the first Indochina war and subsequent warfare collapsed the distinctions between home front and battlefront, okay? What Makanini says happened in the United States during the Cold War. There is no neat distinction between this idea of territory that is networked in infrastructure and that which is smooth and homogenous or territorial, okay? Contra some uh, geographic scholars. Now it's important to note, and many of you um, may be too young to remember these days, but certainly are aware of it, warfare in Vietnam did not end with the first Indochina war, but continued 
in this area of the Black River region through the 1990s. Okay? Just in conversation with Tom Ngo, an anthropologist in Amsterdam. She has done work on the Third Indochina War and found that there was sporadic artillery fire and shooting that lasted through the 1990s. This is a very heavily embattled space along that Chinese and Vietnamese border. Okay? So these tensions have a cumulative effect. The tensions were built into spatial relationships that last to this day. And it's seen in the contradictory mix of exoticization and familiarization of women, as well as the differentiation and the domestication of ethnicity. Okay, you'd think that these would be pulled apart, but they're getting collapsed. Okay? Now, to give you a flavor of what I'm talking about, when I say fancy words like the residue of a formative moment in territorial construction or gendered relationships in space, I want to show a photograph that I took in February while visiting this region once again for the first time in some years <clears throat> about a beauty contest that just happened to be happening while I was there with two colleagues of mine. Notice, of course, this is the Nui Dep Huaban, okay? Um, but in the background is the Museum of the Great Victory of Dian Bien Phu, okay? This gives a sense about the way um, so at the time, oh, I'm sure many of you can read this, but basically they are receiving candidates, okay? And this was ongoing as we were there, okay? The ban flower is what's blooming at the time. Bohinia variegata, okay, it's our mountain orchid or flowering ebony, a small deciduous tree native to Southern Asia that flowers in the spring, okay? But I happened to be there in late February, 2023, when this contest was deciding older age categories. Traveling with anthropologist Tam Ngo, as well as her husband, Peter Vanderveer. We could not find a hotel to save our lives. Okay? We wanted to travel to Dien Bien Phu, but all the hotels were booked. Okay? We got very lucky when some contestants pulled out and we were able to find a room. Okay? And so, of course, when we were going to breakfast, Peter and I one day bumped into some contestants. We're very excited to meet him. They took his picture, and here it is in my uh, presentation. The cont contest concluded after we left. On 13 March, at Dien Bien Province's seventh annual conference on culture, sports, and tourism, the champion of the Ban Flower Festival was announced. Among 20 finalists, the crown went to Nguyen Thi Phuong Uyen, an 18-year-old woman from Dien Bien Province. And here you can see her wearing dress characteristic of black Thai women. She represented, or was the official contestant of Dien Bien Province's Office of Education and Training. Okay? Now, she won the Nui Dien Nhat Prize, and aside from this prize for the most beautiful, prizes were also awarded for best ethnic costume. This Hmong woman here. Loveliest face, bathing suit, natural beauty, and other categories. Okay? Now, if you think this is a unique kind of thing that is specific only to Dien Bien Phu, there are other contests that happened. I was in Phan Thiet last weekend and happened to bump into another beauty contest. This one is the best beach body contest in Phan Thiet. Fascinating, okay? But what was interesting about this particular contest it was, it was there were men and women, not just women, okay? So what is amazing here is that the MC, well, there's a number of things that are amazing, but I wanted to draw your attention to a few things, okay? The criteria were very explicit, and the MC announced it time and again. The most important criteria for men was kwe, strength, virility, okay? Not necessarily health, because they were all smoking cigarettes. <laughs> women was debt, beauty. Now, these women were incredibly muscular, right? But what was amazing, too, was that the MC, when he called the women on stage, said, it's time for the bikini contest. And they displayed their rear ends, okay, in very um, suggestive ways, okay? The prize amounts, the men's prize was 50 million dong, the women's prize was 7 million dong, okay? So there was, at the same time, a sort of heightening of gender difference. There was a collapse of ethnicity into kinness, okay? So my questions for today, 
Why is there an official emphasis on young, pretty women from Dien Bien Phu wearing ethno garb? Or why is Vietnam's government involved in a beauty contest in Dien Bien Phu? What does this gendered, even sexualized representation mean? Where does it come from? And how does this representation accord with lived experience in Hanoi and in Dien Bien Phu? Okay. And here you can see a picture of a Thai woman broadcasting seed. Okay, very different mode of um, planting than what you see in the lowlands, which you're planting bee bits or sort of seeds one by one. These are Kumu women from a festival wearing Thai dress, bearing the imprint of Thaiization, okay? cultural diffusion from Thai peoples. Now, I would argue any answer to these questions must address a very specific place-based history that, as in the picture, is always lurking in the background in Dien Bien Phu. Okay? Sometimes, in the case of memory and other festivals, ritual, the past leaps from background to foreground okay? and tends to dominate. Okay? So I'm going to foreground the past and think about how historical memory tends to conflate place and event. As a result, people in Dien Bien Phu today can be overshadowed by a past that is invoked in landscape and in ritual. Okay? The ritual, every five years, the province of Dien Bien and the, government of Dien Bien, or the national government in Hanoi alternates responsibility for um, celebrations and anniversaries of the great victory in 1954. Culminating, and this is not something that just happens on 7 May, the date of the victory, but happens day by day following each moment in the past. Okay, so it's a month-long, solemn, but very festive atmosphere. In the landscape itself of Dien Bien Phu, the valley floor is carpeted in memorials, monuments, museums, and of course, cemeteries. Okay. So here we see a kind of national ritual, as Grant Evans writes about in Laos, that dates to a particular moment when forces converged on a heavily contested, out of the way place, okay. transforming place in the process and reshaping Thai, Khmu, Hmong, Zhao spaces, now known by way of Vietnam. Nonetheless, I'm not arguing that all of this happened at once. There, of course, are changes as well as continuities in the relations of male mobility and female anxiety. Okay? So this is um, sort of thinking historically about this longer past, dating back to 1954. I'm thinking about three different periods. They are not discrete. They're sort of pulling into one another and spilling over into time. But of course, first we can talk about the 1953-54 um, Great Dien Bien Phu campaign, when mass mobilization created what I would say generalized anxiety, men, women, and alike. Nonetheless, soldiering by kin men sets the stage for gendered encounters, as I will talk more about in a moment. From, say, 1958 to 2000, during the Second and Third Indochina Wars, state-led migration from the lowlands of Vietnam up into these highlands changed the character of mobility. Okay? Official male mobility generates female anxiety, especially among kin people from the lowlands. Okay? Kin women tended to stay at home, whereas their husbands, brothers, cousins, fathers, and so on, were on the move. Okay. In the 2000s, with the liberalization and the growth of Vietnam's economy, we see infrastructure construction all over again, okay, built on the same basis that, of that established in the 1950s, as well as hothouse economic development. That is, economic development happening very fast. Okay. So you see spontaneous in-migration, circular migration from upland to lowland and back, and the region, what is now the Vung Te Bac, opens up for tourism and research. That is, people like me, right? And at this period, we start to see a retrenchment of women working on the home front and men working in official positions, okay? especially among Thai families. 
Okay, so I want to start with this first period, this event, what I call an eventful geography, to think about the event of Dien Bien Phu, the battle and the campaign, and how it shapes this space. Okay? So this might be review, given that you had a talk on this last week, but I will go through it fairly quickly. This geography dates to 1953, when the French general Henri Navarre issued a plan to lure the People's Army of Vietnam to a place near the Lao-China borderlands, far from their base area in the Viet Bac, in order to crush them, okay? And negotiate peace from a position of French strength, okay? This was called the Navarre Plan, okay? It enjoyed strong US support in the early days of Asia's Cold War. Keep in mind, there was a stalemate on the Korean Peninsula. The United States was already invested heavily in this rising Cold War. The French landed paratroopers on 22 November 1953 in Dien Bien Phu, and they built bristling what are called hedgehog defenses. Hedgehogs are those cute little animals with spines in their back, right? These are supposed to be indefensible, or sorry, not, indefe indefeatable, undefeatable, sorry, indefensible. That was an indefensible claim about an undefeatable, um, <laughs> undefeatable base. Okay, it turned out to be a strategic error of grand portions, okay? The only source of French supply was aerial, that is by airplanes, okay? And that was cut off in the opening days of the attack in March. Um, Dulles, the American Secretary of State, even offered the French, his French counterpart, three atomic bombs to save the garrison, right? Which would have killed everyone in the process, of course, okay? Fortunately, French Minister Bidot declined, okay? The People's Army, by contrast, supplied all of their logistics over land, shocking the French, both with the scale and efficiency of their operation. Ever since in Vietnam, the place has been known as the site of the great victory, Dai Tien Tang. Now, this conventional narrative overlooks local folk, such as these Thai women, displaced from their homes by the French using their houses as building material for fortifications and put into refugee camps. Okay. So I am less interested in the battle itself and more in the ground level processes that enabled the People's Army to challenge and ultimately defeat an elite French force far from its base area. Okay. Thai people were the dominant group among a very diverse ethno-linguistic tapestry. Okay. The Sipsong Chow Thai, Okay, was the dominant political form from the 18th century through the late 19th Thai principalities, a confederation of Thai Muang, or Thai sort of um, governed spaces. Okay? It's conquered by the French in the late 19th century. And then with the fa this man's father, Deo Van Long, mapped the borders. Okay? Auguste Pavi, a very famous French geographer and conqueror, mapped these borders with Laos and with China on the north, okay? with the help of Deo Van Long. Okay? So it wasn't just French pushing the thumb down on the people, he had local support. Okay? Um, Deo Van, this the younger, Deo the younger then, um, emerged from this process of French indirect rule, okay? whereby his family, the Deo family, was given legitimacy, power, and wealth. Okay? Uh, much of that wealth coming from opium, okay? the opium trade uh, cultivated by many people, but primarily by Hmong farmers high up in the mountains above 1,000 meters in altitude. Okay? Now, in 1948, after the Second World War, France recognized the Thai Federation, led by Deo the Younger. It was hated by locals in Dien Bien Phu, okay, not far from the capital of Lai Chau. Okay, they're only about 80 kilometers apart. Okay. In part because of internal rivalries among Thai peoples. Also, sheer depredation, exploitation, and cruelty of the Deo family and their henchmen. Now this takes me into the Democratic Republic of Vietnam's territorial construction and state formation in the borderlands, displacing this formation with their own revolutionary government. Okay? They reconstructed power relations in the same place, in the same exact space. Okay? This here, of course, was the 
Thai Federation, Federation Thai, but this became the Vung Te Chi, Thai Mao, after independence, then the Te Bac, and now, of course, the Northwest. Okay. So the same space, different ruling uh, strategies. Militarized state formation transformed colonial borders from colonial borders into national borders. But the borders remained much the same. Locals reported not to France, but to Vietnam. And so there were continuities here. It's the same space, but different meaning. The capital, of course, was still Hanoi. So wartime social mobilization happened in an agrarian society where labor was scarce and land relatively abundant. Okay? This is the inver an inversion of the traditional lowland Vietnamese pattern, where labor is plentiful and land is scarce. In this region, land is abundant. People are few and far between. Okay? There is a very complex socio-political and environmental mosaic okay, that we can understand in the Black River region on the basis of altitude okay, and the presence of Thai Muang. Okay? Clustered in valleys and organized by Ban Muang. Okay, Ban is Thai for village. Muang, again, is a governed space okay? um, or village principality. Thai peoples grew wet rice, controlled trade, and dominated politics. Okay? And we see culturally processes of Thaiization. It is functionally the local model of civilization. Okay? Kumu did Sweden on the hills. And they were bondsmen of the Thai, okay? often enslaved in earlier eras. The Hmong and Zhao people, perched on the highest mountains, practiced pioneering Swidden agriculture in areas considered wild, out of touch by the Thai, where they grew opium, raised livestock, and kept the state at a distance. Okay? Now, during the battle, Kin peoples became but the latest in a long line of migrants to settle this area. They brought downstream Red River Delta into contact, that is sustained contact, with the upstream Black River region. And as a result, they reoriented trade, politics, and cultural influence in lasting ways. Okay. So the puzzle for me, the puzzle for me in writing this book was really how did a place that was historically autonomous, dominated by Thai peoples, and closer to Laos and China, become ultimately Vietnamese? And my answer is twofold. Okay? The construction of territory, Vietnamese territory hinged on two processes. First, as we can see here, Viet Minh and subsequently cadres from the DRV turned local elites alienated by the Thai Federation. They repurposed the Thai Muang for Vietnamese administration and recruited hereditary elites, such as these gentlemen here. And the Muang then endured as a governing spatial unit that regulated land, labor, capital, and ritual activity. They learned this from Thai power brokers brought into the fold of the Viet Minh in 1948. And with this elite influence, the DRV gained access to Thai peasant labor, land, and importantly, food. That would be rations for soldiers fighting the battle. Okay? Again, this is where we see this Duan Ket, Thai King, come into practice. The unity between Thai and Kin starts to take a very concrete form. Okay? The second process of how this place became Vietnamese has to do with wartime social mobilization. Okay? That foregoing slide was about elites. This is about the masses, okay? especially beginning with the 1952 Northwest Campaign, Tien Zik, Te Bac, and then, of course, during the 1953-1954 Dien Bien Phu Campaign. These were formative moments that figured in a longer process of territorialization, that is the process of making territory that transformed space and connected it firmly to downstream centers of population and power. Okay. After the uh, victory in 1952 of the Northwest Campaign spread Vietnamese power through the Muang, 
with the Dien Bien Phu campaign, the state was able to climb the hills, to use the terms of Jim Scott, and reach from the valleys up into the mountains where cadres were able to recruit Hmong, Zhao, Kamu, and other peoples. Okay? They built roads to move soldiers, gathered the agricultural tax in kind to feed them, and there was excitement and anxiety in equal measure. As anxiety increased, so did surveillance. Okay? There is this idea that emerges, it's fascinating, if you read the party papers in light of what's happening in the archival documents of this idea of teo zo'e, right, or teo yo'i, right, to watch over, right, and to watch over has this sort of very curious double meaning. It can mean you watch over a child, a policeman watches over you benevolently to take care of you, but it can also mean someone is looking at you quite um, intrusively, okay? inspecting your every move. Okay? All the while, working as a, what's called a zankong. Okay, zankong is a neologism invented in the early 1950s to describe a new kind of labor on behalf of the state. But it is an inversion of kong zan, citizen. Okay? So it constructed an idea of Vietnamese citizenship in terms of rights and responsibilities. Okay? The rights had to do with equality, progress, democracy, and social transformation. The responsibilities provide labor, food through the agricultural tax, and of course, loyalty, and participation in a monopoly on opium. Now, to give you a sense of scale, okay, the abstract labor, over the nine-month-long Great Dien Bien Phu campaign, some 267,000 Zankong participated, okay? from one month to several months, even longer, in a grueling campaign, okay? full of danger. Okay? During that period of nine months, the population of the Black River region roughly doubled from 300,000 to 600,000 people. Fully 10% of the population participated as Zankong laborers. Okay? Now, these statistics are important. But I do want to caution you that they are very much part and parcel to the idea of territory as technology. Okay, this constructs a particular understanding of this region based on numbers and technologies to rule it more effectively. Okay? Now, what did these processes look like? What did they feel like? How and why do they persist? Now, I'm going to tell two stories. I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to move fairly quickly one of the past, and then one nearer to the present, okay? how these things sort of come into being. Um, I'm largely going to skip over the intervening period, um, and I apologize in advance. But first, I want to turn then to this memoir, okay? where this phrase, arduous, but dreamy and romantic, comes from. Okay. In October 1953, Huang Kong Pham was appointed a political specialist in Brigade 325 of the People's Army of Vietnam. Born in 1925 in Tua Tien Province near Hue, he had to leave his family behind. When his wife gave birth to a girl, his commanding officer denied his request for leave, citing a very urgent situation, and said, let us worry about your family. In December, a brigade cadre evacuated his family to a safe zone, and Pham reported to the Viet Bac base area in Tuyen Quang. He received orders directly from the Army's high command, marched to the Dien Bien Phu battlefield immediately. Okay. So even at the moment of the cadre's departure, the theme of male mobility is in play. Okay. We don't hear from his wife, so the female side is silent. But this makes Marav show its work on the moral rectitude of suffering in silence all the more relevant. Okay? Further, this exercise of state power appears in a distinctly Vietnamese way. On the one hand, the state appears as caring and devoted to its cadres. They'll take care of the family. On the other, there's an underlying assertion of prerogative and control over lives in its care. Now, over the next year and a half, Pham's service in the First Indochina War traces an arc through Vietnam's endgame with France. Okay? He supervised logistics work among these civilian porters and monitored morale among soldiers serving through the battle's end. Okay? His reflections stand out for what he witnessed and acted and remembered, as well as how he felt about it all. 
His narrative humanizes ambivalent but lasting relations between Vietnamese officials and Black River peoples. Now, attached to the Army's General Supply Department, FUM mobilized transportation labor along the Northwest Zone's border with China. A political cadre, he worked for the Department of Politics. He oversaw what was created as the Glorious Line, connecting Ba Nam Kum on the Chinese border with through Lai Chou, Muang Tong, and ultimately to Dian Bien Phu. Okay? And that was the newest of three routes funneling supplies to the battlefield. On the first line, from Dien Bien southeast, okay, down here, porters from Tain Hua used pack bikes uphill and along the Ma'a River here to reach Dien Bien Phu. From the east, trucks plied Route 13 to the other side of the Chinese border with Lang Sun. And when those two sources of supply began to run low, the Glorious Line became all the more important. Receiving aid from Mengzi in China, pardon my bad Chinese, Yunnan, and along this northern route, which passed through the small town of Ba Nam Kum, followed treacherous waterways, climbed high passes, and ended in a depot at Muong Tong, now known as Muong Pong. Okay. So moving supplies along that river okay, was not an easy task. One of the first things that Fum had to do was work with sappers, that is, military engineers, to make that waterway navigable. And these engineers had worked along the Ma'a River first, a bigger waterway, and learning from that experience where they detonated explosions to blow up waterfalls, to make them navigable. They brought that technology to the north, to the Chinese border. Okay, this is a picture of the Ma'a River, and you can see the boats plying it. Okay. Um, okay. Now, as he supervised supplies, he was in charge of working with local people, particularly women. And this is where things to me, it get very, very interesting. Now, a photograph from Vietnam's Archives 3 shows men and women Zan Kong on a riverbank in Lai Chau while unloading a boatload of rice on its way to feed soldiers on the Dien Bien front. Okay? Now, the woman hefting a heavy load okay, wears a brocade on her back, identifying her as Mong. Now, recalling his own experience with similar people doing similar work, Cadre Fum described them as Thai and Mong, and ascribed each of them what he called a way of life. Okay? His encounters suggest the ways in which powerful ideas of ethnicity emerged out of the myriad everyday struggles accompanying and enabling warfare. Now, the glorious line ascended the Sinho Plateau, threading Hmong, uh, villages where, Fum recalled, their particular way of life disrupted his logistics routine but led him to accept different customs. In addition to supervising journeys on the Glorious Line, he organized meals for workers who portaged rafts and rice around waterfalls. On one occasion, he wrote, a Hmong woman sat down crying and ceased working. I was perplexed because I did not speak their language, did not understand their custom. So he sought advice from another cadre who specialized in work in ethnic regions. His colleague explained, their custom is that men and women must be together in one place. And when night falls, they sing and dance happily. He continued, if you force them to live separately from one another, like people downstream, they do not work at all. So even though why she was upset remains unknown to Fum, he nonetheless accommodated what he understood to be her different culture of work. Okay. Now, in March 1954, when the People's Army commenced attack on French positions in Dien Bien, he arrived at a depot on Muong Pong, or Muong Tong. Okay, so while the battle raged at Muong Tain, he awaited reassignment at Muong Tong. Okay. He was proud to be there, in part, because this was the place where Bay Van Dan, okay, many of you might have heard him. Um, there's all kinds of memes on the internet, which is kind of hilarious, <laughs> of people going like this, pretending they're Bay Van Dan, but that is how he met his end, okay, and why he became a hero of the armed forces okay, during a battle against retreating forces from Lai Chou. In elephant grass that was too large for the machine gunner to maneuver, he heroically took the machine gun, held it on his shoulders, 
while the gunner fired away. Okay? Ultimately, he, he died from the concussive um, explosions. Okay? So this is where um, Fum winds up. Okay? More prosaically, Fum grew acquainted at Muang Tong with what he called the Thai way of life. And based on another encounter with local women, he described as far different from that of the Hmong. Having completed supply duty, he awaited his new post with his comrade, who knew about local custom. Okay. Living close to Thai villages and visiting frequently, the two officers sometimes stayed into the wee hours during, lo during local dance routines, or sway, performed by local young women. Fun was blissfully unaware that DRV administrators had cited these same routines when performed before French audiences as typifying the colonial exploitation of women. Quote, Thai women are sentimental, his colleague advised. Make sure you don't get reprimanded for that. For Pham, who had a family he had not seen in months, the sweet and gentle Thai women appeared as a source of temptation. Sometimes they would call out to us very endearingly, he recalled. Oh, Mr. Soldier, over here, Mr. Soldier. Okay. Now, at this point in the narrative, Fum paused to reflect on his experiences during the Dien Bien Phu campaign, once he had, quote, returned downstream to regular work as well as home and family. He records the lyrics of a very famous uh, song called Nye Te Bang, which I remember singing with this group alongside my wife in 2006. <laughs> Full of vivid imagery and written in rhyme, the song conjures a land of stunning natural beauty, pretty, smiling women, and everlasting nostalgia. Each time he hears the song since returning home, Fum, remember, remem, Fum remembers a struggle that was arduous, but dreamy and romantic. In mid-June 1954, on the eve of departure from his beloved Dian Bien, he and his fellow officers enjoyed one last dance with Thai women, leaving the kin men feeling melancholy. Okay? In sum, Thumb remembers a time of trial, loss, novelty, excitement. He evokes the place in terms of rugged landscape, masculine bravery, and feminine beauty. Participating in resource contests and observing actual human subjects, he elucidates the many struggles that accompanied the making of Vietnamese territory in the Black River region. Like the people he supervised, he suffered loss and worried for his family's safety. He too built enduring relationships, encountered novel customs, and felt meaningful, if ambivalent, emotions. Okay. After the battle, okay, I'm going to refer you to my book, The Unintended Consequences of This Kind of Social Mobilization Became Very Clear. Okay? All of the work that went into defeating the French, literally exhausted local people, depleted their food stores, and set up expectations that were not met in reality. People got angry, and they actually rebelled. Okay, so this is a chapter I'm not going to go into in great detail, but suffice it to say that the histories of Dien Bien Phu end in May 7, 1954, with good reason, because what happens after tends to contravene that uh, narrative. Okay? So a number of things start to happen in the late 1950s. Okay? I mentioned before, infrastructure. Okay? A massive dam is built to water the Great Plain at Dien Bien Phu. And through the 1990s, state-led migration and resettlement programs moved kin from crowded delta to the sparse highlands. Okay? There also was a security agenda in these state-led migration programs. In the words of Rudolf de Konig, geographer, the peasantry served as the territorial spearhead of the Vietnamese state. Okay? These programs like Kai Hoang, Vung Kinh Thay Mui, and others moved people from crowded lowland sites up into the frontiers, where they served not just as farmers and settlers, but also as the forward or advance unit of um, the security state. Now, through the 1990s, Warfare in South and Laos during the Second Indochina War and then against China in the Third Indochina War continued this trend of kin male mobility and female anxiety. Okay? But the spaces between battlefront and home front began to widen. Okay? 
particularly as infrastructure development enabled a new kind of uh, migration to this region. Okay? This road, um, photographed in 2012, is the exact same road that was built as a spur to National Road 6 during the 1953-54 campaign. It is now a major highway, again, facilitating the kind of uh, connections between upstream and downstream. Okay? There is rising anxiety, I think, in this later period, particularly among Thai women. Okay? They must care for the home front while the men are at work in the office. They are also exalted for their beauty, as in the contest I mentioned earlier, overlooking the labor they do. Okay? Now, this second story that I'm going to tell you features, um, places me in the gendered processes at a moment when the Northwest was opening up for new forms of mobility. And in many ways, this is why I'm interested in this topic. I realized that I was caught up in these processes okay, in a very personal way. It's no longer just soldiers on the march, but now that we're in the second and third stage of female anxiety and male mobility, when the old pattern of a separate home front and battle front is entrenched. Women tend the home front, while men travel in search of opportunity, be it economic or, in my case, academic. My visit to Vietnam's National Archives in January 2007 began mostly as a social call. I had just come back from the holidays in Atlanta with my wife and her family, arriving in Hanoi by myself for the final leg of my dissertation research. On that cool gray winter day, the reading room director welcomed me back warmly. By then, I had been working there for nine months, a period interspersed with field trips to Dien Bien, the next of which I informed him would begin just the day after next. Okay. After listening to my plans and noting the fruit that I carried, he announced a break to the archivists under his supervision, all of whom were women of various ages. Okay. Numbering a dozen or so, we assembled in his office to share snacks, tea, and stories. Wearing a big smile, a young archivist told of her recent wedding, what everyone agreed was a festive affair, and politely thanked me for my gift. Inhabiting her professional role, she mentioned that fulfilling my photocopy requests had been delayed by another project. Not a problem, I said, explaining that the additional wait would happen when I was in the field anyways. Now, the mention of archival work in the archives did little to change the course of what became our discussion's main theme, namely starting a family and holding it together. Responding to, my still, responding to the still smiling newlywed, I recalled my international departure of the day before when my wife and her family had worried openly about whether I would ever come home. An older married archivist sympathized, explaining that because I was, quote, and this is a quote, handsome, smart, and faithful, my wife was, quote, afraid that you would be bewitched, be ba bu. Here, especially in Dien Bien Phu. I tried to wave away her flattery, but another unmarried activist cut me short. It's true, it's true. Somberly, she continued, many men joined the army and went to Dien Bien, but did not return. You should be careful. Her sympathetic colleague nodded approvingly, speaking a final dut or true. Shortly thereafter, I left Hanoi for fieldwork in the faraway mountains, feeling less like a researcher than a dutiful young man leaving behind caring women made to wonder whether I would ever return. This ethnographic encounter in the archives and others like them incorporated me in the gendered anxieties surrounding male departure for distant, long-term, and perhaps dangerous work. Broadly, the affective response speaks to the effects of war in 20th century Vietnam, particularly on the majority Kin population in the Red River Delta. Notably, my research focused on Dien Bien Phu, where the epic battle in 1954 generated casualty in Vietnam on a vast, but still unknown scale. The violence and loss there punctuates a longer history of near continuous warfare when the Indochina Wars killed or maimed generations of young servicemen and rendered the women who cared for them grieving and burdened. Although not a soldier, I was, according to the archivist, vulnerable to what she called bewitchment. Okay? Note that, um, and more particularly then, these anxieties bespeak a kind of departure, 
associated less with the end of a man's life than with his starting one anew elsewhere. After 1954, the former battlefield became a focus, or sorry, a locus of resettlement by former soldiers, many of whom married local women. Their relationships and the families they established there would span not only the distance of new Vietnamese territory, but also the many cultural differences encompassed within it. Okay? So I don't mean to imply that I, as a young white man, am somehow the same as this cadre who suffered in ways that I can only imagine. I, of course, volunteered for research. He was drafted to serve in the military. But I want to say that this story, his story, and my experience resonated. And with this theme, I think, in very meaningful ways. Okay? We both participated in and observed male mobility and female anxiety. As with the archival record, worry and excitement go together. I, too, was caught up in these gendered relations. Again, before I left Atlanta that time, my parents-in-law could not help but recognize or to observe how marriage to their daughter and subsequent departure for Vietnam resonated with their own life story, as well as their contemporaries in the 1970s, okay, when my father-in-law was the first class, what is it, the first class to be drafted but not sent to Vietnam. Okay. So further, my positionality registered on the archivists in ways that elicited a sense of anxiety welling out of their own experience of wartime. Okay, again, history matters in this relationship between Hanoi and Dien Bien Phu. Vietnam is no longer at war, and the infrastructure has collapsed the distances between Hanoi and Dien Bien Phu. From the battleground, it has become a tourist site, as well as a source of economic opportunity. Nonetheless, Dien Bien Phu still figures in Hanoi's imagination as a site of danger. My friends and colleagues in Hanoi expressed concern for me when riding a motorcycle there in 2006, 2007. But fear about my male mobility, I argue, was rooted in anxiety about untimely loss and suffering felt by women left behind. So this experience sensitized me to the gendered representations still at work on Dien Bien Phu. I think I have a better slide of that. Okay, again, all of these sort of very gendered representations. Okay, who is the woman? Who is the man? Okay. It is a landscape of memory. There are rituals of commemoration. There are gendered representations of space. In other words, it is. There are new maps okay, on old terrain. This map, okay, when I first started traveling to the region in 2006, I had an old tourist map that my friends would look at and say, that's the map you used, right? By 2012, the government had produced or published a tourist map with far more detail, again, very explicitly and deliberately laying out the road for the kind of travel I was embarking on. Okay, okay. so in conclusion, let me just say that history matters in this relationship. Oh, here, sorry. So, in conclusion, my own participation and observation became methodological clues that open the historic and geographic exploration of this space. Female anxiety and male mobility are gendered products of ongoing territorial construction in Vietnam. They register as excitement and romance, but also worry and anxiety. Okay. There is an uneven emotional effect. Men experience more of the excitement, women more of the suffering, silence, and anxiety. At its logical limit, anxiety becomes grief over loss and untimely death. For men, they can be celebrated as heroic for sacrificing themselves in war whereas women are expected to suffer silently. Okay. So militarization then generated affective registers in very contradictory but meaningful pairings. Okay. On the one hand, exoticization and familiarization of women and the differentiation and domestication of ethnicity. Okay. So if the first Indochina war collapsed these spaces of home front and battlefront, Subsequent warfare separated them again into spaces marked by a gendered division of labor. Okay? So in sum, I just want to say I've been interested in this eventful geography, and I want to push back against the kind of representations 
that merge place and event as somehow inextricable from one another. Okay? Dien Bien Phu was and remains a place before it became known as a battle. So by situating this in a longer history, I hope to have brought the Black River region into a relationship with the Red River Delta that has a history and has meaning for people who live there. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, for, um, for that really amazing sharing. So now we uh, would just take the, the smallest little break as we readjust the camera towards uh, our seating area. Um, and uh, thank you for your faith in uh, the supply lines. Uh, you may experience something like uh, maybe like the French soldiers in Diet Bien Phu as, as they wait for those planes uh, circling ahead to deliver. Or maybe you on the Viet Minh side as you wait patiently for the trucks from the Chinese border uh, and, 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 you know, and, 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 and when they had to Take out, take down those uh, those packages into small porter packages for all these uh, 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 people, both the soldiers and the ethnic minority friends that they had to carry up the mountains. So uh, happily, we we do have uh, the food there in the back in case you 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 want to uh, grab something quickly as we make this small adjustment and and Christian for you to grab a little sure. drink. Um, <laughs> Should I take this on? No, no, no. You, you keep it. You keep it on. Okay. And you, you want this table? Okay, so please uh, feel free to bring your sandwiches and, and other um, uh, lunch back to your seats, and we shall proceed with the uh, Q&A session. All right. uh, Christian, thank you so much for that uh, amazing sharing. I, I do apologize that uh, I... Uh, you know, as I was walking in, I immediately, you were saying, you know, and the people were hungry, and they started rebelling, and uh, wow, that was, uh, <laughs> was uh, an appropriate line as I was coming in. I do apologize that I missed a, a few parts, but I, overall, I, I, I thought the, the idea of, you know, infusing gender and and um, you know, race into this understanding of Dien Bien Phu is, is something that is, has been long overdue in, in many ways, right? Um, and you know, it's the, we live in a time when I think there's a new flowering of research into the first Indochina war, in part because of this availability of these uh, archival materials, uh, but there's also, I think it's, it's one of the topics that's seen as maybe a little bit less um, uh, controversial, a little bit less in Vietnam, we call it complex phuc tạp, right? Um, and I, I just uh, wondered two things. The first is when you, um, when you touch on these kinds of topics and when you uh, ask for these files uh, in the National Archives, uh, are there any files that, that were considered sensitive that, that you weren't able to see or was it you know, it was it all pretty open, uh, even though we're talking about some of these issues of race and, and gender. Um, the second question uh, would be, you know, um, obviously you, 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 you end the analysis uh, after Dien Bien Phu, but I wonder if you could talk a bit further about how this influenced the creation of the uh, self-administered zone, Khu um, Tu uh, after the end of the battle, 
uh, obviously today Vietnam we no longer have uh, Hu Tu Chi, uh, uh, but China still does in Xinjiang and Tibet and so on. And and so I, I wonder if you could t uh, speak a bit further about this this um, this region's history in the aftermath. And I guess the the third one just uh, in. It's, it's a side point, but you, you also mentioned the fact that different sort of ethnic groups occupied different elevations and cultivated different things. Um, I remember oh, um, our colleague um, Alfred McCoy at, at uh, Wisconsin-Madison uh, made a pretty uh, big intervention uh, back in, I think, 2012 or something, like, like, or maybe 2008 when he talked about heroin. And, and, and the trade of opium uh, during the f first Indochina War, he more or less accused the Viet Minh of being sort of, not, not so much accused, but he said that the Viet Minh also uh, at certain points uh, you know, used some of this opium trade in order to, to get weapons and, and supplies uh, when they were, well, really hungry um, and uh, for those things. So, I, I, and obviously that's a, that's a direct relationship with the people that cultivate these things. And, and I, I, I wonder if you talked about that while I was hopping in and out, or may, maybe it was one of the things that, that didn't get talked about as much. But um, yeah, so th those were just sort of my initial thoughts and things to pitch to you, yeah. Is that good? Yes. All right. So uh, let me say first that there were certainly files that were quite sensitive in Archives 3. Um, I can go on in some detail. Well, let me just say it very quickly. Um, I was very struck um, by the number of files labeled Sung Don Vua, okay, which I didn't know how to translate um, at the time, but I knew there was something going on. I knew there was deep upset uh, with the sort of DRV state making project. Um, I went back to Cornell. I asked Professor Taylor. He's like, I don't know what this is. And he went to his dictionary and started looking through it. He's like, I don't know what this is. So it became a sort of something that was very curious to me about what was this about? And in short, I was able to think about it in terms of, of a millenarian revolt, okay, led by Hmong and Kumu people. And that's an insight I helped gain through work and Laos studies and Hmong studies um, from neighboring Laos. Okay, again, this place is much closer to Laos culturally and politically than it is to regular Vietnam. Um, so that was one topic. Second topic was opium. Okay, and that was one that I decided, I was telling Sean about this, um, I just decided not to go into detail in my dissertation. But when I went back in 2012, I decided to sort of take a deep dive and see what I could find about opium. And I'll circle back to that question later. Third was land reform. Okay, land reform was very, um, as you know, is a very sensitive topic uh, in the north from 54 to 57. But I had to figure that one out to do the dissertation. And in short, land reform did not happen in this part of the country. Okay, and that, I think, was very much a deliberate strategy to maintain the Thai elite, through which the Vietnamese government could get access to land, labor, food, and so on. Okay. So those were three topics that were quite sensitive, but I got very lucky because I was working closely with Archives 3 to develop an archives guide, and so they felt that they could trust me and I was able to get good access. Second question, post-battle, what happens in the history of the coup de chi, or the autonomous zones? This is a fascinating history, and I think this is, it, in, the history to me is really important and needs to be written. Um, but I can say, at least for that first five or six years, when it's still the Thai Mayo before it becomes the Tay Bac in 1962, there is strong local support, particularly among the Thai elites who benefited from this new Vietnamese state making project. Okay? It was also quite popular with some of the so called small ethnicities, particularly Kumu people, who thought that they would be able to get out from under the thumb of the Thai by working with kin cadres. So it was much more complex than a simple kind of colonization um, or colonial domination from Hanoi. There are all kinds of relationships that were being renegotiated and developed as a result. So it's a very interesting story and very complex, actually. Um, a third question about elevation, ethnicity, and heroin. So Al McCoy's work, of course, was foundational for any of our understanding of what happens with opium and later heroin during the Indochina Wars. Um, but what I noticed in his book was that he basically stops his history of the Viet Minh um, or the DRV involvement in opium in 1954. 
And so when I was starting to look at these documents, when I went back in 2012 and started to get access to them, I realized that a couple things. One, it continued as before. And in fact, when there is a very big problem, when the Sung Don Vua calling for a king movement happens, one of the ways that one of the local Thai power break brokers by the name of La Van Hack, La Van Hack is able to renegotiate the terms of the opium monopoly to the benefit of local growers and largely takes some of the steam out of that rebellion. So very interesting stuff. And of course, it's a monopoly, so there is direct state intervention and management of this very valuable crop. Okay? It's interesting to me because with opium, it stops, to be, stops being called tuok fian. It becomes san fum mian nui. It becomes san fum dak biet. There are all of these different kinds of euphemisms, um, non-timber forest products, special mountain product, that start to take over in the archives because the government is basically dealing in a very dangerous and addictive substance. But it is one that has very serious medicinal value. During the Indochina Wars, it was a source of morphine for soldiers who were suffering. So there was a legitimate interest, I think, for managing this crop. So opium, I think, is a very interesting topic that I could go on in great detail about. And you know, I, I, I would actually love for you to go on, but maybe uh, we will take some follow-up questions from the audience first, and then uh, uh, we have at least a few directions already for, for further exploration. So I see one from Kang Ming here. Uh, hi, Christian. Uh, my name is Kang Ming. I'm a senior in a history in a major. Oh. Um, so, so first, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I really, really enjoy it. Um, as someone who's you know who's from Hanoi and also who's been exposed to all kinds of um, gender representation in um, propaganda uh, awards, so I I find this fascinating. Um, also, you gave me a you know media existential crisis too. So thanks. Um, I have a question. Uh, so when we're talking about the male mobilization from mm. the lowlands to the highlands, um, and then in the memoir of the one of the northern countries that you are examining. examining uh, then, you know, the description of, uh, say, women of ethnic minorities was sentimental rating Um I couldn't help but notice, like, was it deliberate that, like, the cadre was portraying these women as, I don't know, like, available for relationships, mm -hmm. as in, like, were they single? Or, like, was there any mention of them being married? If they were being married, were they being portrayed as, like, overtly maternal? Because uh, I know there's a long history of Ba Mẹ Việt Nam Anh Hùng helping the soldiers too. So I wonder what about the gender, you know, the uh, representation of, let's say, relationship status mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. among ethnic, well, ethnic minority women. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a wonderful question. And I think um, I had to skip kind of fast through that topic, but what's interesting to me is he's very much, he's kind of a participant observer, right? He has a family, he misses them, but at the same time, he's talking about a kind of temptation, right? So there, I don't know if the women are available. Again, they're silent in this narrative, but except for when they say, you know, bodoi oi, bodoi oi, and I, you know, so it's a very kind of like sentimental kind of call and response that he, that it pulls him in, right? What's interesting to me about that kind of, about this memoir, is the Thai women are sentimental, sweet, right? Perhaps available, um, they're dancing, they want him to come in, but they stand in stark contrast to the Hmong women who are crying kind of for reasons that are unclear to him and he doesn't understand. So this, to my mind, sort of maps onto these longer kind of relationships in this region where Hmong people are kind of inscrutable, right? They do things that people don't understand and they're dangerous and they might rebel, but we have to take them into account and try and give them some of what they need, right? Whereas the Thai people are sentimental, you can work with them, even perhaps have a relationship, right? So that is the kind of contrast that to me comes out of that, that moment. Okay, so hi. Uh, so I'm a freshman and I have not decided what I major yet. Mm. Uh, I am also not very familiar with uh, 
scholarly vocabularies. Mm. So uh, can you, uh, so I have two questions. Sure. The, the first one is, can you uh, uh, like, uh, the, I don't know, like, uh, explain to me how territory is a technology. Yes. And be, yeah, because I, I, as I have said before, I'm not very familiar with these scholarly vocabulary. Okay. And okay. And the second question is, uh, uh, I am also exposed to a lot of gender representation on uh, street propaganda and stuff. Mm. So can you tell me how this representation uh, contributes to the uh, the the construction of the legitimacy of the nation state? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank Excellent. You. No, those are wonderful questions, and that you should be proud of asking them as a freshman. Um, <clears throat> let me take each in turn. Okay, so territory is a technology. So let me start by saying there, this goes to much of, there's a tendency to treat territory as given, as natural, as already formed, and you see this in diplomatic and military histories. The fight was over Vietnam, the territory of Vietnam, right? But that space may not have been Vietnamese. People there did not understand it as Vietnamese. The Thai people thought of it as Thai space, right? Other people thought of it as in French space, right? So it has to be built and constructed in particular ways. So there's a very um, strong push from critical scholars to challenge the idea that the Battle of Dien Bien Phu was between, was over Vietnam, as though it's already Vietnamese because it was very much a Thai space. So it had to be built right, and constructed. So that is the process of territorialization. right? That's the ongoing social process. The second idea of territory is that territory is a technology. Territory is a technology. What that means is it becomes a way of achieving rule over people. So territory, if you think about it as mapped, demarcated space, that requires a kind of calculation, a kind of mapping and cartography to measure it right, to um, think about its dimensions, all of which rely very heavily on mathematics, right, quantitative reasoning. And that kind of quantitative reasoning carries into population. If you think about what is the population of Vietnam, already you've imbued the technology of territory for understanding people, right? You accept those borders for the measurement of a particular population. So that way it becomes very effective as a way of achieving rule, not simply a process, if that makes sense. <clears throat> and this comes from a Foucauldian sort of idea, um, and Foucault is a very fr famous French philosopher, that these ideas have effects, right? That they produce something, and that quantitative reasoning is very important for understanding it. Um, so that sort of territory is a technology, right? The, third, the second question, gendered representations in street propaganda. Um, I mean, I'm fascinated by this stuff. I think it's really important, so, but I think it's important to, so how does that contribute to the state legitimacy? I think what it does is it hark, harks back to a particular narrative of the Vietnamese past that helps legitimize the state. And that state then is associated with a valorous, sort of very brave and heroic military conquest and project that brings women along not necessarily as participants, but as kind of an audience, um, someone who will take care of the home front. So it has a kind of propaganda value in contributing to the narrative, um, I hesitate to call it a myth, but it is a very powerful historical narrative, right, about saving the nation from um, foreign domination, foreign intervention, that tends also to reproduce particular gender roles, right? And so it's those gender roles that come with it that I'm sort of interested in here, right? Why is it that men are, portray are portrayed in certain ways, women and others, right? When in fact that overlooks all of what women did in these different kind of capacities and what the men were doing actually in the place, right? Uh, uh, thank you so much for, for the presentation. Uh, my question is about a, um, a, I don't know how to call it, a te television series mm. uh, recently featured on VTV. No, not recent, like a few years ago. The mm -hmm. Đường, Đường Lên Điện Biên. Uh, yeah. What is it called? Đường, Đường Lên Điện Biên. Ah, Đường Lên Điện Biên. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
uh, and um, it's um, it's kind of like has a kind of villain in that who is a I think an ethnic minority mm-hmm. who was being a French spy among the Vietnamese ranks, mm. and then uh, and none of that. So how how was the how was the kind of like collaborator of the French depicted in throughout the the period mm. throughout the battle of Viet Minh Phu, like. Are there any historicity to the kind of uh, mm-hmm. collaborators they pick in um, communist propaganda after their battle? Absolutely. So there, um, this is where it gets really tricky in terms of, so I mentioned this before, there's sort of like, um, in terms of thinking about gender relations, you have to think about it almost like a three-dimensional matrix, right? And it's the same thing in terms of loyalties, right? There's ethnicized loyal, there's, you can think about who was on whose side in this sort of shifting, sort of very complex mosaic. And so the picture I showed of um, Deo Van Lung, okay, the younger Deo, he was on the wrong side. Uh, well, for him, he was on the right side, which was the French side, right? But in the subsequent history and in the archival records, he was on the wrong side, okay? So in 19, December 1953, um, shortly before Bay Van Dan um, does his sort of heroic stand against um, actually his son-in-law, Deo Van Long's son-in-law, who's leading that force, he flees for France and winds up initially going to Hanoi, but then he winds up in exile in France and lives out his years with his female retinue, and that's the end of his story in many ways. His son, one of his sons is caught after the battle at Dien Bien Phu and is publicly executed. And so there is, and so this is something you will get in, if you look, this is a tip, if you're doing um, histories of places like this, the secondary sources are really useful. That was a detail that came out of a police history of Dien Bien Phu. Okay, so the police history tells the story of his son who was executed for his crimes against the people and for being a part of a puppet government. So there was quite a bit of payback in the time after that battle, um, including officials who were on the so-called wrong side, as well as people who were killed during the time. There were Hmong on both sides, Thai on both sides, Kamu on both sides. So it's very important, and this is what I think is important, again, another historiographic trick is if you can find who the people are and trace their stories over time, because there are consistent personalities. Um, There is no such thing as the Hmong. There's lots of different Hmong people. There's lots of different Thai people, just as there are lots of different kin people, each of whom have their different kinds of loyalties. Hi, it's me again. Uh, <laughs> I'm very gone, so I have questions, but also I have maybe some, uh, I don't know, let's say comments. As in, like yeah. earlier, and thanks to Eng Hoang mentioned, then uh, last week we had a talk with Dr. Andrew Bellisari, who's working on the Vietnamese uh, enemy rally of the North African soldiers. Mm. Um, and, you know, uh, I, f- I find uh, very fortunate that like today's talk also coincide with the, um, maybe what we can consider like exoticization of another race or of another ethnicity. Uh, I also want to share that um, in the Vietnamese um, rallying uh, leaflets, then uh, for cadres, you know, on how to train uh, people to do the, to rally the enemy, mm. uh, there are two things that I find relate, um, relating to your topic today. Mm. Uh, first, then, uh, like that I just mentioned about the collaboration of the ethnic minority people participation in the French army. Uh, then there was also documents of people, uh, uh, there was the document of the Viet Minh uh, talking among the countries like, oh, we need to um, rally our Thai brothers, our mm-hmm. Hmong brothers mm-hmm. come over to our side. Uh, but then there was a mentioned talk, like, talks that we should um, encourage the Hmong and Thai sisters to persuade their husbands and sons to come over our side. Interesting. Yes, um, and then later, then in a more general context, and then talk about like, oh, how to do the in general. So this was so appealing to uh, white French and or, or, or German and or North African or West African, saying so like, oh, we should also rely on TM uh, Phu because they are sentimental, mm-hmm. and then they could uh, persuade them. Um, we saw that this was probably like an euphemism of like, you know, maybe prostitutes or, you know, even like weaponizing sex to, to um, emulate people too. 
So maybe for your talk today, uh, I, I think, I'm thinking maybe I will reconvene with uh, Dr. Andrew Veliseri to explore more on this side of uh, relying on the female sentiment. Mm -hmm. uh, my, now I have a new question, is that like now your talk about um, gender and ethnicity today reminds me of like maybe a more, let's say contemporary representation that I get from my childhood. Uh, it's um, there's this novel by uh, the a formerly party novelist uh, Nguyen Ngoc who writes about um, Anh Hùng Nu, uh, the uh, was he like the Ede hero mm. who uh, who was living in the Central Highland and mm. then who was leading uh, the uh, warrior sorry guerrilla warfare against the Americans. Um, in mm -hmm. the 1960s. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you ever want to explore uh, maybe the same theme, but then in the different chapters in Vietnamese history too, because mm -hmm. I find this like the same similar romanticization of ethnic city. Great, thank you. Sure, so thank you for, very much for those comments. I think they're very useful. So let me say the training of local forces by the French. I know less about that, um, because I was focused more on the Vietnam side. Nonetheless, what was interesting to me, and I think this is where it came in very useful that I was doing field work at the same time I was doing work in the archives. I was coming across documents um, in the archives as well as photographs that indicated virtually all of the zankong, right? The workers on the roads were women. Um, and, I, and not just women, but Thai women and of course Hmong women and others. And so I went and talked to a local informant of mine who remembered these days. And I said, so where are all the men? Like, where are the Thai men? Where are the Hmong men? And he said, oh, that's easy. They had all been drafted into the French forces. <laughs> so they were basically fighting for the French, and the women then were fighting on the Vietnamese side. And of course, then they suffered attrition, and many had died as well. So there is this gendered sort of difference that's happening on the ground at that moment, which helps explain why so many women had to come forward. And again, I would just reinforce the idea that this is an area known for labor scarcity. Very few people, so labor is the sort of limiting factor, not land. So have finding people at all costs was most important. So older people had to work, pregnant women had to work, that was a big controversy, right? Um, and young people as well. The second part, Winton Ngoc, that's a very interesting tip. I do think there is something there about how to bring so-called ethnic minorities into the fold, particularly in wartime. And I think this story, I'm sure, could be told in the Central Highlands. Um, in ways that would be very similar, well, be very interesting to compare with the Northwest. Let me just say that in Northeast, in, the Tong, in Tonkin, the work of John T. McAllister was very important to me because he does a very important contrast with people in the Northeast, many Hmong who were against the DRV project, whereas in the Northwest, they were more in favor. So again, there are these very sharp regional differences in addition to some of the same processes happening. Wow, thank you so much for uh, both to Christian for the uh, amazing sharing um, and, and those, uh, you, you truly are the encyclopedia when it comes to, uh, and, and I think much, much better than the encyclopedia for sure, <laughs> when it comes to, to um, you know, the Vietnamese Northwest and, and, and Dien Bien Phu. And, and thank you also to our wonderful audience who uh, are here at lunch uh, on a Thursday right before a very long holiday, mm -hmm. a holiday that, uh, if I may also remind you, uh, part of that holiday right, comes from a legend uh, about <laughs> the origins of the Vietnamese nation, right, where half of the Vietnamese children stay in the lowlands and another half come to the highlands. So as, um, as you uh, leave us, uh, hopefully with your bellies as filled as the uh, soldiers who were well supplied around Diet Bien Phu uh, at, at, at during the battle, um, you will also reflect on this, reflect on also the, the series that we've had uh, in, over the past three lectures, uh, Christian Lenses today by Andrew Belisaris uh, about the Dick Vunt and, and the relationships uh, between white and uh, um, African um, soldiers of the French Union and before that also 
um, the, uh, the, the, the talk by Professor Nicola Weber, who was here earlier, but had to go uh, off to, to uh, a committee meeting um, about the relationship between the King Vietnamese and um, the Cham people in the South, right? Um, this is, I think, a semester where we're talking a lot about this relationships between the King majority and the ethnic minorities. Um, it's also um, next week, uh, when you come back, remember, break is until Wednesday. Thursday, we are back, and we are going to be back already with another really great talk, free lunch again, uh, for sure, <laughs> we'll come early. Uh, very early, uh, for sure, uh, and it will be Pamela McElwee uh, discussing her uh, excellent book called Forest of Gold. As you know, it's a famous quote from um, President Ho Chi Minh, uh, and the way that Vietnam has approached um, conservation and the natural resource management of its forests. Um, so, uh, also a really, really excellent book, and I think uh, these talks, you can draw many, many different connections. Um, so please watch out for, for these announcements and uh, uh, have a great break. Thank you so much, Christian. Thank you so much to our IT team and, and, and our um, communications team and administration teams that made this possible. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you all.